Hello and welcome to the Overly Animated Podcast, where we take animation seriously. We provide fan-oriented and analytic discussion on a variety of animated shows, movies, and anime, currently featuring Steven Universe, Star vs. the Forces of Evil, and Samurai Jack, among others. I'm Justin Cummings, and today I'm joined by the man, the myth, the legend, frequent commenter Steve, Steven Zeck. Yo! <laughs> this is your first time on the podcast. How does it feel? Oh, I'm honored. Um, one, I've been one other podcast in the past, a guest, so I really don't do this much, so it's a, it's a nuance for me. This is a, we're, we're still in a bit of flux here. We've had a rough couple of weeks on the Samurai Jack. We can't catch a break. The first Samurai Jack podcast had to be delayed because I was sick. Second one, I was still sick dealing with no voice. We got one normal episode up. We were going to do one last week, and then the Rick and Morty thing happened, so there was no Samurai Jack. We're finally back, and Michelle is still on vacation in Canada, so we had to rally the troops. So we are here today to discuss episode four of season five of Samurai Jack. I believe it's chapter 95. Uh, you can hear the last couple of podcasts that I did with Michelle over at OverlyAnimated.com or by searching Overly Animated on iTunes or your favorite podcatcher, including Stitcher. So let's dive into this week's episode. First, I, I my personal favorite segment is the weekly update on the mysterious Night with Horns. Mm. There was no Night with Horns this week from what I saw. Did, mm. he, did he not pop up or did I miss him? Uh, you, well, you more familiar with him than I do. If he did, I missed him too. Yeah, it seemed definitely they were, I don't know why they'd get away from that, because they've been doing it every episode so far, and then there was nothing this week. I don't know if they just wanted to really focus on Ashi or what, but we had no update from the Mysterious Night, which is surprisingly more of an update than we usually get. <laughs> he usually just stands there. Oh. <laughs> so... What are your overall thoughts on the episode? Okay. I mean, third person. I thought this episode was, I kind of found it very, mostly hilarious. I thought it was a very funny episode, believe it or not. Um, I thought the, you know, their, um, Jack and Ashi's interactions, you know, it's, it was, it was kind of cute. It was funny and it was interesting. Um, Ashi, though, for a dangerous, you no, know, Ninja Assassin, she is adorable, I have to admit. They, their interaction was so funny. I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed oh. this episode because Jack is not known for his humor, but man. Oh and, oh, and like I said before in my email, um, Ashi in this episode, she reminds me a lot of pre-Redemption Paradox, especially the part when she's like, die, die, die. The the entire monologue where she's going on and on about the great generous Aku as he's carrying her through the uh, the belly of the beast, so to speak, just felt so paradox the, the whole time he was dragging her. Oh yeah, then I probably know what's one of my favorites because paradox is gosh, she's my like favorite gem. So of course I'm gonna love this episode. This was such a good episode. I thought not. It was different. It was definitely the most different episode of the season so far. Yeah, it's very felt. Very, um, what's the word? It, intrusive, a very, um, intimate. That's the word, intimate. Yeah. It's focused on one little plot here. It's just in one little space. We did not really go over, you stay away from like the overall world. One episode. I, and I personally, I like episodes like that. As much as I love world building, I also love, you know, episodes like this. So I'll give my thoughts, and then we can dive into kind of the episode itself, because there's a lot of interesting stuff here to get into. But overall, I thought this was a really good episode. It was different. Um, the last one ended with, like, a big fight scene that was really cool, really well done. Yes. And then this one starts, and it's just quiet. It's a very quiet episode, all in all. The pacing is completely different. The It almost feels like a different show compared to last week, which... Last week was such a, a pinnacle. I think, honestly, that episode could be up for an Emmy uh, next year. Oh, oh. Like, honestly, if Samurai Jack's putting something forward, it will probably be episode three of this season. It was just stellar. But oh. then we get into this one, it's just a completely different tone, completely different feel. But still good. Oh, I I know. I mean, what is Jack, like, bipolar? Like, two episodes ago, 
he felt really bad about killing a human. And then last episode, he was very remorseless, didn't really care. In this episode, he cares again. It's like, really. Uh, (laughs) It's honestly, I I think that after this season's over, if there has not yet been something, I'll probably do a standalone episode of Michelle about, like, assessing Jack and, like, how they're portraying his mental state. Because it's been really interesting. Because on one hand, we're seeing aspects of, like, PTSD. On the other hand... We're seeing this kind of um, delusions and hysteria, and, and it's this big question I think the season has been asking is, like, what is Jack's current mental state? Like, how does he process all this stuff? And this episode is really interesting, and they do seem to go back and forth a lot, and I think even Jack, like, questions that within himself, like, this constant swinging back and forth, because on one hand, he's like, they chose their fate, and on the other hand, he's saying, no... I basically chose it for them. Mm -hmm. And so it's this really interesting dichotomy. We talked a lot in the last episode about how Jack was kind of remorseless in his ideology, and it's not the squeaky clean ideology we usually get from Mm -hmm. someone like Steven or Aang, but he kind of walks it back a bit in this episode. Not completely, but even he's starting to question kind of the harshness of his own ideology, which I thought was really, really interesting. What did you think of that whole... The, the scene of him and spirit, Jack. Oh, I thought that was awesome. And it's like he's like uh, at war with himself or his past self. And it's uh, – I can't really think off the top of my head, but it reminds me of a lot of animes I've seen with main protagonists have that type of um, storyline. Um, I can't really think of any off the top of my head. I mean I don't know. Maybe perhaps a show like hey, Cowboy Bebop or something like that. I – I can't roll my tongue, but yeah, it's very anime-ish to me. That's what it is, but it was, and also very, uh, very old world, like a, it's like a movie. It just. Right. It definitely had, <laughs> it had a war movie vibe to it. The, yeah. the whole character of Jack feels very much like a cinematic epic. Um, oh, like Saving Private Ryan, perhaps? I, I'm really not an expert in war, war movies, but I'm just trying to roll stuff off the top of my head. It reminds me a lot of like a Mel Gibson movie, like something yeah. like uh, Braveheart. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. Brave. Uh, Go Newer, Hexar Ridge, splitting off from Mel Gibson, something like Last Samurai, like those kind of long cinematic epics. That's kind of the way we're seeing Jack characterized. Like he's this, on one hand, he's a stoic character, but on the other, he's very tragic as well. Oh, uh, you just remind me. Now I know who you remind me of. You remind me of. Not the main character, but the second main character in the Samurai Shampoo. I forget the guy's name. The guy with the glasses. I think Jin was his name. I haven't seen it yet. Okay, okay. Well, people who knows uh, who knows that series know who I'm talking about. Yeah, that's who it must be. But, uh, like I said, it's uh, yeah, Jack man. He's he's oh, he's a really very interesting character, man. He could be up for for like character of the year, man. He, he's like like you said. He is the opposite of Steven, which is nothing wrong with it. I love Steven, but, you know, it's nice to have some variety, though. It, it is really nice. Uh, some of you guys know I'm a gender studies minor, and so one of the things I do in college quite frequently in my papers is look at gender roles in media. And Dylan and I have talked about there's not a lot of good, diverse male characters as far as personality traits. They're all either, like, hyper-masculine uh, ladies man, like Lance from Voltron, or Hunk. Basically, the characters we get in Voltron of, like, Lance, Hunk, and Keith at their worst are the three main guys we typically see in animation. We either see the super cool guy, the super flirty guy, or the super hungry guy. <laughs> and so, to get not one, but two, you have Steven on one end, and then Jack on the other. These very different looks of masculinity. And they're honestly really interesting, complex portrayals. And I think, I honestly think 2013, maybe on, actually 2014, I'd say when Steven really kicked in, we're starting to see the era of the complex male protagonist. And I know that sounds almost redundant because it's like, well, we've always had male protagonists. But now we're really starting to look at what what is masculinity. And I think 2010-ish, to like 2013 was the start of like the female protagonist era with stuff like Korra coming in and that's still going like that's not stopped it's just now we're also starting to see complex male protagonists which is oh. really interesting oh yeah T- tell me about it i mean for the longest time man um 
I am a heterosexual male, but I've always sort of gravitated towards more shows with more like a female protagonist because I can so relate to them a little bit more. So it's nice to see this new era when you kind of have like you have more depth to the male characters, male protagonists than we used to. It used to be like they had to be all tough or stuff or just have this arc or not really – they don't want to showcase their – their deep thought, their deep feelings, which is what I got for a lot of like shows with the female character centric shows. I mean, even like, looking at more yeah. adult oriented animation, we had two shows have their season premiere this past week. Uh, Rick and Morty, as we mentioned, mm-hmm. and then Archer had its season premiere. And if you look at Archer, Rick, and Samurai Jack, they're three completely different characters. And I'd argue that even though Archer's been on like going eight seasons now. And Rick is definitely an interesting character. I think in four episodes, we've gotten more complex ideology, at least, out of Jack, and more complex depictions yeah. of masculinity. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I know. I mean, I've seen shows like that. I mean, he Jack's definitely a way interesting character. I mean, I mean I've, a show like I saw recently, um, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, it seems each JoJo next year after, after next, after, after, after all masculine and stuff, it's just not really my cup of tea too much. I mean, personally, I take someone like Steven or Aang over the typical male protagonist we've been getting from the last few years. Right. But <laughs> that's all I'm saying because, you know, I'm a person who, who like express their feelings and also a person who's not looking to just, you know, Fight every like every moment. Who who fights? Ask questions later. I'm a person who likes to try to solve my problems as diplomatic as possible, and I like I like characters that can relate to that. I I could probably go on depictions of masculinity and femininity for hours. As I mean, <laughs> that's kind of what yeah. I've been spending the last two years of my <laughs> life doing, and what I'm preparing to spend the next two years of my life doing, oh. in order to then spend the rest of my life getting paid to do it. So I could go on with that forever, but let's dive back into the episode itself. Okay. We start with um, we kind of knew one of them would have to survive. One of the daughters of Aku. We figured it'd be Ashi. Do you think any of the others are still alive? Because we never saw their bodies. Oh yeah, well the other ones that fell. Well, actually, would not surprise me. In fact, I expect the two to be alive because if we're kind of going to turn Ashi eventually, at least towards being. At least more um, non antagonistic toward Jack, at least a more civil relationship. I can see those two coming back later on and kind of the other two sisters and kind of being like our final, like, main enemies before we get to Aku. And I could see pretty much those two sisters seeing Ashi's character development, think of her as a traitor, and Jack and Ashi got to team up against the those other two sisters. Yeah, I think it would give us some great development out of Ashi, too. Um... Of course, Ashi has the amazing. Uh, is it Ashi or her mom that's voiced by Gray Griffin? Well, I think well, I, she's. Uh, she, I know Gray Griffin's Ashi. Yeah, I'm not okay. sure though if she voices all the female characters on this show because Samurai Jack does not really have a very large cast typically. So no, especially not a spoken cast. And when they yeah. do have other spoken characters, they bring in guests like Tom Kenny came in to play and a Gray, Starmoosh. Yeah. And Grace, she could pull off. She could voice like any type of character. So she, she is awesome, man. She's Especially like Especially seven identical sisters. Yeah. <laughs> so. Like, we have, we've not, this episode, we finally got to hear Ashi a fair amount. And of course, Greg Griffin nailed it. Like, it's Greg Griffin. Of course she did fine. But if we do get that kind of confrontation before the fight, I want like a good scene of dialogue. And if it's true that she's playing all the sisters, Greg Griffin arguing with Greg Griffin would just be it impeccable to see like i want that really bad like we need we have such a star talent we need to use her to the best of her ability and i think that would do it oh uh, tell me though do you think ashi is looks like a brunette princess alana Mm, i know a little bit yeah because he definitely because that's why i knew she's probably very very important because that's kind of genie's style yeah, okay, oh, yes, you're right. I'm sorry, I was thinking Elena, like Elena of Avalar. No, Alana from, uh, semi Titan. Titan. Yeah. Yes, like, the two characters do look almost identical now that I'm thinking about it. <laughs> um, the same kind of, like, hair swoop up, and then it's like a little mm-hmm. volcano almost. 
Very, very similar style. I don't think we're going to get a uh, a parallel to Lance in this. Uh, mm-hmm. We're not going to get anyone in that kind of lanky teenage style, but definitely, yeah, I'd, I'd say, I see the similarities. I can see this I is... It's a nod. Yeah, it's definitely classic Gendy at work, which I do really, really appreciate. Well, if we never, like, and I remember what you talked about a couple episodes ago, like, hopefully this is successful, we could finally get a continuation of Symbionic Titan and get that conclusion. I mean, right now, yeah, I think, the, I think Symbionic Titan is the only, one of the only shows of his that has not aired on Adult Swim at this point. The Samurai Jet, or had an Adult Swim continuation. Because oh. Dexter's Lab, technically speaking, yeah. did premiere an episode on Adult Swim with Rude Removal. Oh. <laughs> yes, I know. Uh, so but we got to hit the reruns, trifecta. Though. It airs in reruns, but that doesn't count. Yeah, it airs in reruns, yeah. but so does Samurai Jack, and that's what got it for the new season. I'm sorry you get off topic right there. <laughs> oh, you're you're fine, definitely. <laughs> this is This is definitely a more experimental podcast. I think we're going to have a good time, but... So we get Jack, uh, Ashi's all chained up, hanging from the trees, swinging back and forth. Die, die, die! Die, die, die! (laughs) Yeah, yeah, well, (laughs) Barry. And then Jack kind of going on his monologue of like, I wonder if I can make her see that, uh, Aku is the evil one and I'm not. Die, samurai scum! Maybe not. (laughs) <laughs> you see, that's what I meant. This episode was hilarious. Yeah, that had some funny moments, even though it was very trippy. Jack's musing is just so good. And then we end up, uh, they accidentally both end up swallowed in this beast. And all I could think the entire episode was, I'm watching the Ocarina of Time. I'm watching Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, and we're stuck in the stupid water dungeon. We've been swallowed by the giant fish, and I've mm. got to carry this stupid princess who's annoying as heck around with me the entire time. <laughs> That's all I could think, and it was so fun, and I I feel it has to be a nod. Like, Gendy's a nerd. He's writing a Luke Cage comic right now. He's a nerd. And, I, I feel oh. like he knows what he's doing. And, and, listen, and I love these type of storylines when you got these two people from the opposite side. They get stuck together, and they have to work together to survive, and perhaps set up redemption later on for one of the characters. Um, that is something I, I love, and personally... um. Talk the podcast. Uh, that's something I kind of wanted to see in season one of American Dragon Jack Long. They could have done that, but you know, and also other shows perhaps should do more of that stuff because I love those type of plot lines. Yeah, I I do love when we get these kinds of episodes where it's uh, a hero and at least like a secondary antagonist kind of stuck together, having to work together. Although Ashi didn't do much, which I'm glad she was chained up because she would have been killing him the entire episode. But, like, we see this over and over. Like, we saw it in Danny Phantom did it. A lot of shows have done it. I think Spider-Man did it. Didn't we technically do that with Steven and Paradot, or? Oh, yeah, I'd say we do it with Steven and Paradot. I'd yeah. argue, um, <laughs> uh, I'd argue When It Rains, or whatever the name of that episode is, yeah. <laughs> was yeah. kind of that plot. But it's, it's such a fun plot, and we do get a lot of interesting character development. I love, I love the set. I love the design of the beast. Mm-hmm. Just the whole interior. Uh, it, it's kind of whaleish. I think yeah. it's the best way to compare it. Mm. Yeah, a beast looked. Oh, you look beast. What can I say? <laughs> oh man, but uh, I kind of thought though. Kind of Ashi, the character who is raised, I think she values killing Jack over her own life. Oh yeah. And, yeah. So obviously though, just saving her is not going to persuade her. To help her, to help you, Jack. It's like you need more than your self-preservation to win her over. And I thought, though, the ending, the very ending, that was very interesting. I mean, I thought that was kind of a brilliantly animated thing. Scene. Oh, it was. We're gonna we're gonna get to that, I think, right before we sign off. But I I think the line of dialogue that was most impactful was when Jack was musing about seeing machines that are so undying in their loyalty to a cube but never a human. And, mm-hmm. and I think. I think that is a really interesting thing that we're confronted with sometimes. It's like we can we can imagine a machine or some kind of program that's like unwavering, but to see a human have the the rigidness of a machine is it's startling, honestly. To see a human so unwavering in something, and Jack's the same way though, mm-hmm. or at least he was about killing humans, and then we see him yeah. we see him kind of break down that rigidness yeah. this season. 
Yeah, I, I just thought though him last episode it was just more of him just like this is the first time he killed a human. He just kind of lost it for a second and then regained his composure. It's like uh, you know, like sometimes if you see. Like, I see characters, sometimes when they see blood on themselves, their own blood, they lose it. They lose it for a moment. And that's what I pretty much thought was happened with Jack. I, I think what happened with Jack is more his entire morals were confronted, but he didn't have time to, like, really sit down and process this. Like, I, I want to draw another comparison to Steven, because um, these two characters just make such a good case study. Heck, oh, I, I, I need it. A- I need a, I need a, write another gender paper and use these two. But, um, that makes such an interesting case study because we look at Steven in the moment of finding out, like, that Rose had, uh, shattered Pink Diamond, uh, spoilers for episodes and episodes ago of Steven Universe. Steven kind of just puts it down, puts it to the side, and then when he's back home, then he starts to process this. Like, we're just now seeing Steven kind of handled this stuff. Like, he waited a while, and now he's starting to deal with these emotions, process them slowly, really try to uncover what he's feeling. Jack didn't kind of have that luxury. Like, he was stuck in a situation where he's bleeding out, he's just murdered a human for the first time, and he might have to do it again. He mm-hmm. has no time to process, so he needs mm-hmm. to, he needs to come to a conclusion very quickly. Mm-hmm. And so, on one hand, we see, this kind of slow healing and recollection process. And on the other hand, we see someone mm-hmm. still in war, still in battle, having mm-hmm. to reconcile their morals and get back to the fight. And I think that's, I think that's why he was able to bounce back so quickly is because he needed to and he knew he needed to. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. You know, you know who, who Jack kind of reminded me of that reminds me of a certain character. Um, I know you're familiar with the show. I'm sure most, a lot of people are Attack on Titan. He yes. reminds me of Armin. When Attack on Titan, when he had his little development, when he, cause, when he, cause he, that, that's what kind of remind me of Armin, who was very timid and very, like, scared and stuff, but when he, like, first time he got in this, like, this death, life or death battle, he kind of really just went nuts for a second, he kind of, he really, like, cause he wasn't really used to it, it's so against his nature, and that's what I think we saw here, too, to a lesser degree, only without yeah. a whole bunch of, yeah. It was, it was definitely an interesting development, and so we end up with Jack and Ashi in the Beast, and we see both of them have these hallucinations. Ashi's of, I guess her mother, like, screaming at her to kill the samurai, like, don't forget your yeah. one purpose. And then Jack, with his, uh, I guess, episodic now, encounter with Spirit Jack, having mm-hmm. this whole discussion about, you know, why are you doing this? Why are you saving her? And what's interesting is the design of Spirit Jack is the season one through four design of Samurai Jack. So it's mm-hmm. almost like we're seeing the new show and the old show kind of have a dialogue together. And I think that's really yeah. interesting. The show that the Jack that represents the older show is a lot more two dimensional. It's mm-hmm. a lot more black and white, yes or no, life yeah. or death. While the current one it, Mm. is more conflicted and i think that's showing the show's kind of maturity and evolution and i think that's a yeah. really really interesting way to communicate through the the gap in the show i think it's a really interesting way to kind of reconcile <laughs> these two different tones so like, yeah. you look at one through four it's not the same show it's still a good show but it's not the same show oh it's better it's it's just way better if i do if in my opinion um and it's it seems though like yeah, Western animation now, it's more action shows. We have more depth now. In the old days, it pretty much used to be like you have more depth in anime compared to like Western animation with a couple of exceptions. You know, shows like Gargoyles, perhaps, or Avatar Last Airbender, of course, or Legend of Korra. But, and it seems like a fun – it seems like East meets West to me. But Right. <laughs> and I mean Samurai Jack's always – you know what? That's unfair. Gendy has always – had a big anime influence. Like, look at Jack, look at his his Clone Wars series, the 2D Star Wars Clone Wars. Look at Symbionic Titan. Gendy's kind of always had this anime influence. Even even Dexter's, which is not an anime style at all, has so many anime nods throughout the series. And so it's like, he's clearly inspired by anime, and I think 
as America has become more open to deeper anime, Gendy's mm-hmm. been able to use more and more ideas from anime. Mm-hmm. I think that'd be an interesting case study. Compare like what anime were mainstream in America at the different times. Because like when he made Dexter's, he was referencing a lot of like maybe Neon, Gel- Neon Genesis, Speed Racer, Voltron, stuff like that. Kind of the classics, Astro mm-hmm. Boy, those kinds of anime. Mm-hmm. Samurai Jack are getting a bit more Dragon Ball Z ish. Symbionic Titan Cap- were we're not quite at Sword Art era, but we're like Is it like Voltron influence? On which one? Symbionic Titan with the whole Definitely a Voltron influence, but I think for the for the mech side, I think for the characterization side we were more open to stuff like Oran High School Host Club, Fruits Basket, and so more yeah, kind of deeper plots, and I think that's kind of what we saw because Symbiotic Titan was almost a slice of life, oh, not per- quite. Uh, tell me about it. person. The thing, the storyline I'm most invested in, I most cared about was Octus and Kimmy. That's the exactly thing I- <laughs> like that's why we need more episodes. We need to know what happened to Octus and Kimmy. And she, I, I want her to fucking get they get back together and um, you know, find out the truth and stuff, and you know. <laughs> Um, you know, and, um, it'd be so awesome, and also, like, I think there'll maybe a whole town maybe find out, and also, I want to meet present day Baron, I want to see if he changed for the better, or if he's still an, you know, a jerk. So, and then we kind of move forward from Symbiotic <laughs> Titan, where it's like, yeah, we're, we're one, it's fine, we move from, like, those kinds of plots, and now we're at, like, this <laughs> era of stuff, uh, being really big in America, like, not Attack on Titan, but more, I guess, psychopaths, stuff like that, has really kind of taken hold, and so we're able to go even deeper. It, it's kind of like this evolution of what America's willing to accept, and Gendy's kind of followed that, and I think that's really interesting. So, getting back to the episode, somehow, <laughs> miraculously, getting back to the episode, I think my favorite moment is when Jack actually goes up, saves Ashi from the, the crab thing Oof. that had taken her. That was, that was such a a calm moment because we don't actually see Jack fighting the crab. It's just him saving yeah. Ashi. Because mm-hmm. that's what's more important than that scene. It's not about the fight. It's about characters. Even, yeah, it's like like Spirit Jack said, you're going to save her again, aren't you? Mm-hmm. And this also gave a really interesting confirmation. We had seen it with the Scaramouche fight, but again, Jack's literally sitting there talking to himself. Like, Ashi sees him talking. And so he's he's losing his mind. Jack's mm-hmm. truly losing his mind, and I think that's going to play a bigger role as we progress. Mm-hmm. So, to to wrap up, we finally get out of the whale beast. Beautiful, beautiful animation in that scene. We get to this island, and this is what was so cool. The the ladybug. Like, oh, she's literally about to go and kill Jack, finally. She sees mm-hmm. the ladybug, has this flashback to her mom uh, crushing the ladybug, saying it's a distraction. She sees the ladybug, because she doesn't drop it then. She doesn't drop her weapon then. She drops it when she sees the ladybug land on Jack, and he, mm-hmm. like, cares for it, and he doesn't crush it. It Jack could tell her all he wants that Aku is bad, Aku is evil. He's the good guy. He can tell her that all he wants. He can save her all he wants. It took that, that tiny thing of him not even trying to show her anymore, but just him being who he is to finally show her that he is who he says he is. Like, that's what it took was this mm-hmm. demonstration. And I think that's a really powerful statement of like, you can tell somebody a mm-hmm. million times. It's when you put that in action that, you know, they might finally believe you. And I thought that was such a cool way of doing that. Mm-hmm. We, we don't know if Ashi like actually is going to team up with him. We don't know what she's going to do, except that right then she didn't kill him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't think she's like turned Jack's side just yet. I think it's just a more of a ceasefire. She, I think now she is going through some conflicted stage of her character. That's what I think. And um, and like I said, very symbolic that that ladybug towards her past. And what I think um is going to happen um I got this crazy theory though. Are we going are we going to discuss the uh previews like the for the next episode i have or? not seen the preview oh okay, i like to okay. go in blind okay okay i'm sorry i won't i 
Uh, I do have this theory. It's not, it's not related to that, but uh, you, but um, yeah, I thought that was very beautifully done because I was I was scared. I thought for sure for I thought really for sure that he was about to stab him. Like I was like it was gonna be a dark ending, but luckily she you know she changed her mind at least for now. For now, yeah, it's like <laughs> it, it, it's not like we're in the best place. Like they have nothing. They're both kind of injured. They're stuck on this little island with nowhere to go. But at least neither of them are dead is the one upside. And and like I said, I think regardless, though, no matter what Aki, do, Aki does, I think she's a changed person enough that if we run into those, those other two sisters who might still be alive, they're going to see her and say she is tainted. Like... Like, the, uh, the, fact that she, the fact that she didn't kill Jack right yes. then is enough. Like, we saw that. It's enough. I think no matter what, she's gonna be, she's a, tr- she's a traitor, even if she's not a traitor. You know what I mean? Like, the, you know, sometimes villains, they, they kick, they assume, they just label you a traitor no matter what. I think that could happen if we run into any of the other two daughters of our coup, if they're still alive. And I think they kind of been setting up Ashi from the beginning as a sympathetic one. And so I think we're just finally mm-hmm. seeing that kind of come to a conclusion. So we end just, it's a very solemn ending. It's like the one upside is no one's dead yet. Oh. And so yeah. it's, it's, that's what I like about the show. They're not afraid to have very neutral endings. Like oh. it's not a happy ending. And you know, I got this, this regular theory, but you think it's possible though. Next time we get back to the island, we have a time skip, and now they have a child, and then we because there's because as we know there is no limit to time skips on this show. We're yeah, not this, the- <laughs> yeah, it's like Jack's been gone like fifty years now. I <laughs> I foresee a time skip, perhaps. I do not see that drastic of a time skip that they have a child. That'd I be cool do, though. It, it'd be really. I'd be stunned, <laughs> and I think it would. <laughs> It would be shocking the first couple of minutes, but then I think it would really, it would boggle people, but it would also be ballsy as hell. And Gendy's always been yeah. ballsy. Like, it's Gendy we're talking about. And yeah. so, I, this is the guy that showed uh, Mace Windu crushing General Grievous's chest in. Like, fun fact, it, Star Wars Revenge of the Sith, the reason uh, Grievous has that cough, yeah, Mace Windu just stomped and broke, like, all of his ribs and oh. collapsed his lungs. Like, Gendy was not afraid to show that. Mm-hmm. He, I, I don't know what he'll do. I never know what to expect from this man. So, it, it'll be interesting. I'm very excited to see what happens next. But that brings us to the end of another episode of Samurai uh, Jack. Time flew by. The, the end of, yeah, the end of another podcast. We've been going about half an hour of, mm-hmm. we, we've discussed everything under the sun. Uh huh. The, the one, the one last note I do want to give as a shout out. In media criticism, one of my classes, we were watching an old Powerpuff Girls episode, okay. and the mayor was doing a roll call of the whole town, and one of the names he called was Gendy McCracken, a mix of Gendy uh, Tartaka- Tartakovsky and Craig McCracken. And as we were leaving, I looked at my teacher, and I just go, just so you know, I caught the Gendy reference, and I highly appreciated it. <laughs> what did he say? He just looked at me and said, you're a nerd. And that was the end of class. Like, it... I'm a communication major for a good reason. Like this, I don't fit anywhere else. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in for another Samurai Jack podcast. Uh, as always, leave us iTunes reviews. We do love, love, love iTunes reviews. If you want to support us, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash animated. We have all new revamped reward system now. Go check that out if you haven't yet. All right. Mm-hmm think this is still what i'm supposed to say so thank you to all of our current patrons especially our patron of the podcast nate aka nathan fillion and thanks as always to our patreon executive producers john ryan steve and alex steve thank you for not only being an executive producer but jumping on an episode no problem um i just like to mention um i do have a blog on the on the, on the website called, on little witch academia so if you haven't read it yet check it out um, we're up. To, we just started the second count today, and so I'll be after I'm done here. I'll be watching the new opening all day. So, <laughs> yeah, as always, check out our blog if you don't read it. I know I've been off on my total drama blog. I just got a new job recently. That's kind of taking up a lot of my time. 
However, hopefully by the time this episode is up, my article on the craze of the Mulan 1998 promotional uh, Szechuan McNugget dipping teriyaki sauce <laughs> as brought on by Rick and Morty will be up. Hopefully that article will be up by this point. So check that out. Check out right. Steve's Little Witch Academia article. We've got all kinds of articles going up from a lot of people. Check those oh. out, guys, if you don't read them. Oh, one more thing. Um, I'm trying – maybe in the future I'll probably do like a, a vlog on the rest of season one of American Dragon Jake Long as a follow-up to your little podcast you did for me. So, I'm, so that could be in the future. I'm not, not definite, but just keep an eye out for that. Woo. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry to – interrupt you sir oh no you are absolutely <laughs> fine i even have in my notes do plugs for upcoming podcasts and blog posts so you are absolutely fine uh coming up we have dylan and i have in the pipes i believe another survivor coming up soon we have oh what we're we doing we're doing a round table on white diamond at some point for steven universe <laughs> so stay hyped in addition of course we have all of our usual round tables samurai jack's going weekly I don't know what Rick and Morty is doing for their schedule, but whenever that airs, we cover it. Mm-hmm. I don't think we're covering Archer this season, uh, but just stay tuned, guys, as always, for all of our upcoming podcasts, and we will see you all next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.